Now I'd like to bring in my good friend and host of the Megan Kelly Show podcast. By the way, a great podcast, everybody. You got to go get your podcast, Megan Kelly. Get your get your Megan Kelly on, Megan Kelly. Megan, thank you for joining us. A huge, huge week going on. We have impeachments. We have social media. Let's start with the impeachment of Donald Trump. Good idea, bad idea for both sides. Um, I don't think it's a good idea because it can't go anywhere. And it, you know, if they want to be symbolic, there are many other ways of doing that. I think uh, I understand people are angry and that Trump behaved terribly, but I don't think this is the answer because the primary purpose of impeachment is to eject somebody from office. And you know, there's a there's another foolproof way of doing that, which is wait a week. Yeah. Well, what about those who say? You know, he needs to be held accountable. The left is saying, look, if we don't do this now, then what happens the next time a president doesn't like the outcome of something and incites violence and people die? That's ridiculous. You, then, then he will be impeached or she will be impeached if she is in office and there is time left in her term um, when, when the act, the controversial act, takes place. There are many ways of punishing Trump, and they're already happening for his rhetoric and his behavior, uh, you know, in between the election and now. And we're already seeing those unfold. But I don't think putting the country through another impeachment and looking at a potential Senate trial that takes place during the opening weeks and months of Joe Biden's term serves anybody. Uh, and, and frankly, least of all, Joe Biden. So if this is just punitive, Nancy Pelosi was super happy when she impeached President Trump the first time. And she said on Bill Maher, he'll always be impeached. So maybe she just wants to say he'll always have been impeached twice. But they're not going to get a conviction. They don't have the numbers in the Senate. So it appears. And even going through that process over the first couple of weeks or months of Biden's term doesn't seem to make any sense to me when the ultimate remedy they already have. They already won. You know, Megan, this week Politico came out with a poll, which kind of shocked me, even with what's going on over the since January 6th, uh, likely 2024 potential candidates for president leading that list at 40 percent. One Donald John Trump kind of shocked me a little bit. D does that surprise you? Um, a little, I guess. I don't know. I, I don't think his core supporters are ever going to leave him. You know, we've seen that. And, and no matter what happens in the Trump presidency, as outrageous as it may be, and this is definitely the most outrageous, I think his detractors are always like, this is it. This is the one. And then they're like, why? Why not still, right? And I, I do, my impression in, in trying to listen to Trump's most ardent supporters, even in the past week, is that they don't see him as personally culpable for what happened at the Capitol last week as his detractors do. Now, it's up to your audience to make up their own minds on this, but I think that's why his numbers are still high, because his core supporters aren't blaming him for last Wednesday. So let's move on to the other big story. Social media uh, basically looks like they've, well, we know they've pulled Trump and some of his uh, Trump uh, websites off of uh, their platforms, but conservatives, others, other conservatives are saying they're being deplatformed as well, either fully, Bongino says Parler is being de uh, deplatformed, some other conservatives. I've lost 100,000 followers on Twitter alone, haven't complained about it because there are a lot more losses going on. However, do you see a bias within social media or is this just literally what they're saying is they're pulling down right wing extremist groups and that's where we're seeing some of the losses? Yep. Um, no, I've lost almost 100,000 myself. And, and then when you look at these Democratic accounts, how, Nancy Pelosi and so on, they're going way up. So it's not just the, a, a purging on, on the perceived right. It's also an inflation on the left. Uh, and Twitter says, you know, first, first they lie about it. First they said, oh, we're just, you know, some people don't provide an email or a cell phone number. And so, you know, their account isn't really matching up. And, and therefore we make sure uh, we got to clean them out in case it's a bot. And then they admitted that it's about people who they, uh, they think have problematic posts on QAnon or something like that. So once again, Twitter is the ultimate arbiter. I think it is, it's well beyond any of that, though. Forget all that, because that's not that's small ball. I think Trump's ban from Twitter is outrageous. I think it's absurd. He's the president of the United States. And yes, he is sometimes incendiary. But the two tweets that got him booted off of Twitter, ultimately, were him saying, my, my supporters will not be treated unfairly. And secondly, I will not be at the inauguration on January 20th. After everything that's been said and done, those are the two. Right. Meanwhile, the Ayatollah Khomeini is on there calling for jihad against Israel and for people to join the Palestinians in the fight. That's fine. That doesn't even get a Twitter warning, Eric. Not even a warning. Not even the 
this is disputed, right? Um, and and Trump is yeah. banned forever. But but forget Trump, okay? Because Trump, like it or not, is moving out of the Oval, Oval Office, and it's about the the rest of the right now and the crackdown on them. The the total deplatforming of Parler is a serious thing. Maybe you've never heard of Parler if you're watching the show. Maybe you have, but it's basically it's turned into a right wing Twitter. It was meant to just be a place that really embraced free speech and didn't crack down on everybody's little word. Now it's turned into more right leaning because that kind of a forum is attractive to Republicans. Not only did they take it off of the apps on your smartphone, on Google phones, on, on Apple phones, um, they have removed the entire ability for it to exist by Amazon removing its uh, server capacity. Parler's been killed. It has been assassinated by left-wing big tech executives. And why? Because they said there was incendiary talk prior to the Capitol Hill riot. Let's talk about what was on Facebook. Let's talk about what was on Twitter. The stuff on Facebook, according to Glenn Greenwald, who was on my podcast this morning, and he's been studying it, is far worse and far more widespread than anything we saw on Parler. So why isn't Facebook having its server capacity, which is also provided in part by Amazon, pulled? I'll give you one word, ideology and people know it. Yeah. And unless people stand up to these big tech bullies, it's gonna keep happening over and over and over, just as we've seen over the past weeks and months, them cracking down on individuals to date. You know, I, and I think that's a really, really important point. I am a, free, a, a, a pro free market person. I believe companies like, like Twitter and Facebook should be able to put who they want on when they want. However, when they go ahead and, and, and administer bias the way they do and, and, and administer at the basis of ideology, at the altar of ideology, they've changed from a free market business into some sort of publishing company. They've decided to publish certain things and not publish other things, which is fine also, but if they're going to go ahead and do that, then Megan, and, and Trump has been really for, up front on this, for some reason it's just not gaining the steam, it probably should. Um, the Section 230, where it says that social media companies can do what they want. However, if they go ahead and do that and become publishers, where ideology plays a role in what they publish and what doesn't, then they need to be held accountable the way other publishing companies, the way media companies are held accountable. Right now, they hide behind that 230 rule where they can say, eh, we didn't say it, we had nothing to do with it, someone else said it. But if they're allowing someone to say that in incendiary uh, comments and then pulling others for, for those similar comments or even less comments, they've become a media publishing company. Do you disagree okay. or agree with that? I will tell you this. I think it's bigger than 230. I think we should forget 230. This is not about 230 anymore. This is about big tech acting as an arm of government. They're big enough, powerful enough, and monopolistic enough that they should be treated as an arm of government. There is case law, a lot of it, to support doing that. And what that would mean is that Un unlike most private industry, they would be subjected to the First Amendment, which tends to, which governs governmental behavior, government crackdowns on free speech, not that of private industry. They've crossed over. They've crossed over. And so what needs to happen now is they need to be, we need to acknowledge that. Somebody needs to sue them. Parler, I think, which filed an antitrust case to get right. against, which I don't see as very strong, um, should amend its complaint to, right. add, or to, to add this argument, get them declared an arm of the federal government for all intents and purposes, and then they're going to have to be subjected to to the requirement that one may not discriminate when it comes to viewpoint. Right. Viewpoint discrimination and cracking down on free speech is not okay from the feds, and it's not okay from big tech. All right, we'll get it. we're going to leave it right there. Always great talking to Megan. Again, the Megan Kelly Show on podcasts across wherever you go. The hottest new podcast around. you got to listen to it. It is absolutely stunning, awesome uh, to listen to. Megan, always good to have you on as well. Thank you. See you, Eric. See you soon.